Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> These are the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church in Corinth. And uh, part of the work that they, or part of the, um, the efforts that they made was to uh, remind the people that their work did not come with much challenge. Uh, from people with inside and, and outside. And um, here again, Paul uh, tells the congregation, the, the congregation in Corinth about the struggles that they have had on the mission field and yet uh, where their comfort lies. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 1, Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed, we are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the, at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Our Song of preparation is number 372, At the Name of Jesus, Every Knee Shall Bow. We rise to sing the four stanzas of number 372.
please also turn with me in the back of the Blue Psalter hymnal to page 26. Page 26, as we look this afternoon at Lord's Day 19, question and answer 52 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Page 26 in the back of the hymnal. <clears throat> in question and answer 52, we're asked, how does Christ's return to judge the living and the dead comfort you? We answer, in all my distress and persecution, I turn my eyes to the heavens and confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in my place before God and so has removed the whole curse from me. All his enemies and mine he will condemn to everlasting punishment, but me and all his chosen ones he will take along with him into the joy and the glory of heaven. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're looking this afternoon at the last but by no means least confession of Jesus the Son in this section of the, of the Apostles' Creed. But unlike what, what we've confessed previously, this article deals not so much with what Jesus has done, but what Jesus will do. And so this article points us to the future. We've seen that Jesus, having completed his earthly ministry, has ascended to heaven and has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And now we confess that from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, before we get into why this is important, let's pause to remember that this is a truth that is taught in innumerable places in Scripture. And this is not something the church made up. It's based on the Bible, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just a few examples. Acts 17, verse 31. Paul informs the Athenians that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, that is, Jesus the Son. In Matthew 16, verse 27, Jesus himself says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, we read, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, Paul charges Timothy to preach the word faithfully in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. And then in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 and following, Paul consoles the church with the promise that God will give rest to those who are troubled in this life <clears throat> when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance. And so we, we may, indeed we must, believe in the second coming of Jesus. But let's be honest. This is not something we think about all the time, or not nearly enough, is it? At least not here in North America. Maybe Christians who are persecuted in many countries cry out and pray about this a lot more than we do. And, and I think part of the reason, at least, that, we're, uh, that uh, we don't think about this too much, we don't dwell upon the second coming of Jesus Christ to judge the living and the dead, at least partly, is because we're having too much of a good time. Life is good for the most part. Or maybe it's even that we, we get too taken up with the, the troubles of this life. Maybe it's because the devil has given us so much to occupy our thoughts and our eyes and our ears. There are lots of things that we would like to have. There are goals that we have set for ourselves. We have ambitions. And while it's good to be busy and productive, we're quite often not left with enough time and in effect not enough reason to think upon the second coming of Christ. And yet, here it is in the confession that we claim to be a faithful summary of what a Christian must believe in order to be saved. And so once again this afternoon, we must ask, why is it necessary to believe this? Our theme then, as we look at question and answer 52, is this, the church on earth confesses the necessity of believing in the glorious return of Christ from heaven. The church on earth confesses the necessity of believing in the glorious return of Christ from heaven. And we'll see that this confession provides, in the first place, patience in suffering, and in the second place, confidence in the outcome. 
Well, the first reason we confess why it's necessary for the church on earth to believe in the glorious return of Jesus from heaven is that it provides a tremendous amount of patience in our suffering. The Catechism speaks of all my distress and persecution, which is quite a different picture to what many believe the Christian life is, isn't it? Wouldn't it be great if we could say that when someone becomes a believer, they are for the rest of their lives free from all the problems and hardships that other people face forevermore for the rest of their lives. But we know that that's just not true. We know that we continue to live in a fallen world and with these sinful fallen bodies. We know that Christians are just as vulnerable to illness and hardships and problems and trials like everyone else in the world. In our congregation alone, we have those who are afflicted with, with terrible back pain and migraines, and MS, and Crohn's disease, and diabetes, and high blood pressure. Some have done battle with cancer. We're not spared from broken bones or organ dysfunctions. Some among us have or, or still do suffer emotionally with things like depression, anxiety, postpartum depression, bipolar disorder. Our families are touched, our extended families are touched with addiction, divorce, and death. There are singles among us who would love to meet a good Christian man or woman and settle down and begin a life together. Some among us are a little more anxious from month to month than others when it comes to paying all our bills. And then there, there are the internal struggles that we all have with, with our own personal sins, the, the various bad habits and traits that we have that affect our marriages our relationships, the unity in the congregation, our personal peace of mind. All of us have moments when we say with David, how long, O Lord? Every Christian knows the frustrations of, of distress, the distress that we confess here in, this, in our catechism answer. And then there is persecution. The church continues to dwell in the midst of those who hate her. Peter warns that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Revelation 12 speaks of Satan of making war against the offspring, that is the children of Christ. Jesus warned in Matthew 24 of his church being delivered up to tribulation and killed and hated by all nations for his name's sake. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 that all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. Boys and girls, persecution, by the way, is when someone is mistreated because simply because of who they are or what they believe. It's unjust treatment. It's treatment that they don't deserve and much more harsh than necessary. In our passage, Paul, Paul speaks of the hardships that they endured because they preached the message of Christ's salvation. In verses 8 to 10, he speaks of being hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. And Paul speaks here of being hard-pressed on every side. The, the Greek verb means to crush, as you would press someone, let's say you press someone right into a corner. And what he's trying to say is that they were attacked from so many angles that they quite often felt surrounded by their enemies. And problems and opposition closed in on them, as it were, so that they felt at times perplexed, confused, not fully understanding what was happening and why and what the outcome would be quite often. He speaks of them being persecuted in verse 9. And the, the Greek verb that's translated persecuted literally means to hunt. They were, they were hunted down like animals. And he goes on to say that they were carrying around in their bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. In other words, as a servant of Christ, they shared in the sufferings of Christ. They were hated. Many desired their death because they lived for Jesus and because they preached his message. One example in Acts 14, verse 19 and following, we read of the Jews coming to Lystra, following Paul there, and having persuaded the multitudes, we read that they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city thinking that he was dead. And so persecution was never far from the missionaries. And it never stops. 
In our Tuesday night church history class, we're learning about the persecution that Protestants faced at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation. And we, we were reminded again that many were pursued and arrested and left to rot in stinking dungeons and tortured terribly, and many were burned at the stake or hanged or drowned. And today, this kind of persecution still exists in many parts of the world, in China, in North Korea, in India, Africa, and many Islamic countries. We read, I'm sure, or saw on the news of the Yazidi Christians in Iraq, many of whom were murdered by ISIS. According to Newsweek magazine, and I've toned this down a little bit for the sake of the children, uh, but Newsweek magazine reports this. In August 2014, ISIS members stormed Sinjar in northern Iraq, murdering around 3,000 men and older women and taking thousands of women and girls into sexual slavery, repeatedly abusing them and selling them between fighters in public marketplaces. Yazidis were forced to hide on Mount Sinjar without food or water and were given the choice between converting to Islam or being killed. And this is just one example of the persecution of Christ's children that exists still in the world today. Every week, we have those uh, great notes in our bulletin from the voice of the martyrs, and we read of the horrific atrocities being committed against Christians in many parts of the world. Crucifixions, beheadings, burnings. It never ends for those who confess the name of Christ. And even though we don't face that kind of physical violence here in North America... We certainly feel our share of persecution and hatred. We risk today in our very tolerant society, tolerant of everything but Christian, Christian uh, values and teachings, but we risk ridicule, we risk even lawsuits if we speak of Christianity publicly as the only way of salvation and the Bible as the only truth. Look at the, pro the, the protests and the riots that are going on in the U.S. because people believe that Donald Trump is a threat to abortion rights. Today, to call transgendered people and homosexuals to repentance is called a hate crime for which you can be, be arrested and, and charged a tremendous amount of money. You can lose everything. And things may just get worse. And yet, in spite of all of this, there is consolation. We confess in our catechism in all my distress and persecution, I turn my eyes to the heavens and confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in my place before God and so has removed the whole curse from me. Here's our consolation. One day the judge of all the earth will return. We can confidently await his coming because he has said so. And he never lies. And so as we read or as we watch the painful news of the suffering of Christians in the world, as we look at our own failings and shortcomings, as we feel the pressures of the world closing in on us, we turn our eyes to the heavens. We remember where, where Jesus is and that he lives and that he reigns and that he will come again as judge. You know, when my children were growing up, and I don't think this is uncommon in many homes, but one of the ways that they would keep one another in line was to say to each other the dreaded words, wait till mom and dad come home. And that was usually enough to, at least to get the offender to stop what they were doing or to start doing what they should have been doing. And sometimes the only comfort for an older child who is left in charge or a younger one who is being pushed around in the home, sometimes the only comfort for them is that mom and dad is going to come home and they're going to right all the wrongs and in a sense, that's the posture of the church in these last days. We're waiting, knowing that our Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back as He said. And all that we have endured will be dealt with at that time. All who have wronged the church will be made to see the error of their ways. Now, when this is going to happen... How long will we have to endure troubles and sorrows? How bad is it going to get before Christ comes? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us these things. But we know that Christ does not break His promises. And we know the Bible does not lie. And so we may be patient in suffering, knowing that history is moving toward an appointed end. What we endure now will not continue forever. We know that. Christ is coming unquestionably. 
And that's why we must continue to confess that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. But as we confess the necessity for the church on earth to believe in the glorious return of Christ from heaven, we see in the second place that we do so with a great amount of confidence in the outcome. We confess in our catechism, all his enemies and mine he will condemn to everlasting punishment, but me and all his chosen ones he will take along with him into the joy and the glory of heaven. Now we confess here, and this is again based on the Bible, catechism we confess is a faithful summary of scriptural teaching, but we confess that two things are going to happen at the return of Christ, and only two things. The enemies of Christ will be eternally condemned, and the beloved of Christ will be eternally blessed. There will be no second chances. There is no purgatory. There is no opportunity for anyone to reform their ways. There will be no one left behind. Christ will return once, and then final judgment will happen. Now, on the one hand, all his enemies and ours, we confess, will be condemned to everlasting punishment. Again, this is based on scriptural teaching. For instance, in Matthew 25, verse 41, we read that Jesus will say to the wicked, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In 2 Thessalonians 1, Paul speaks of Jesus taking vengeance on those who do not know God, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Revelation 20 verse 15 speaks of those whose names are not written in the book of life being cast into the lake of fire. Now, of course, this is not a nice thing to think about, and I don't think any Christian really sits rubbing their hands gleefully thinking about the punishment that is going to come upon the wicked when Christ uh, returns, about their final destiny of the wicked. And, and certainly this must move us to greater efforts to evangelize, to warn others of the coming judgment, and to tell them about the only way to escape God's wrath, that is by believing in Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners, because here again in this is an area where we have to take God at His word. He will return, and at that time He will exact punishment upon the enemies of His church. On the other hand, we may also be confident in the fact that at His return, Christ will take to be with Him, me and all His chosen ones, into the joy and glory of heaven. Again, Matthew 25, verse 34, Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Listen to Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. Beautiful words. Uh, are well known, I'm sure, of great comfort to us. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. That I jo now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And so for the church, for true believers, the second coming of Christ is not something that causes us to fear. Rather, we rejoice in the thought of the second coming of Jesus. We indeed pray, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. That's why even Paul can say in verses 17 to 18, in light of all their, their troubles and all the hardships that they had endured on the mission field, in verses 17 uh, to 18, as we heard earlier, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And Paul speaks here almost tongue-in-cheek of, of, of their light affliction. And, and yet we know that their suffering was both severe and intense. And the point we can draw from this is that compared to our future glory, 
Anything that we endure in this life is as nothing. The joys of heaven will so far outweigh the sorrows of earth that they will seem insignificant. Think about it this way. A few decades on earth of enduring sin and the hatred of the, of the world compared to an eternity, never-ending existence of sinlessness, glory, and exceedingly great joy in the presence of God. No comparison whatsoever. And we may be confident of that outcome because the Bible is very clear and God does not lie and he does not change his mind. What he has promised will come to pass. And that's why it's necessary to continue to confess in the Apostles' Creed that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead because we rob ourselves of great consolation when we forget this and we risk becoming anchored to this world a little too much because we forget that our citizenship as believers is really in heaven, that this world really is not our home anymore. We're just passing through. Congregation, as members of Christ's church on earth, we confess the necessity of believing in his return from heaven because it provides us with great confidence and comfort. We are going to face difficulties in this world. We have to be constantly in our guard against spiritual attacks from outside and within. We'll continue to wrestle with our flesh, with the world, and with the devil. But we may be assured that Christ will return to judge the living and the dead. Let us believe this, lest we allow our hearts to be brought to despair or we become obsessed with worldly things. May this confession instead be to our confidence, our joy, and our great comfort. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this confession. Thank you for the things that you have told us in the Bible that we could not have known that Christ has not only ascended to the right hand of God, but that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Thank you for the comfort that this gives us in light of the trials and tribulations and sorrows and tears that we go through in this life, the disappointments that we face. We thank you that someday when we stand in heaven, all that we have endured will seem as nothing. In the meantime, Father, help us to think of those who do not know you, and who will certainly fall under your wrath, that we may be praying for them and speaking the gospel to them. And we pray that your church may grow and extend to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 370 is our song of response. Day of judgment, day of wonders. Let's rise to sing the four stanzas of number 370. <laughs>